five comes quick, folks. So we have a bunch more folks filing in, but I want to keep us all accountable with time. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'd also like to thank my excellent colleague, Harmony Seberg, for helping out behind the scenes today and helping everyone be as prepared as possible for a live webinar, because anything can happen, right? Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Taylor Edelman. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I am the LGBTQIA plus health and harm reduction manager here at the National Harm Reduction Coalition. I oversee our Lighthouse Learning Collective program. Um, and just a quick overview, some housekeeping things. The first half of today's webinar will consist of two presentations, one from attorney Jordan Blisk and the other from Dr. AJ Eckert. Both will set the stage for our panel discussion, which will be the second half of the webinar. The last 15 minutes of the webinar will be dedicated to Q&A. So please, please, please make sure to utilize the Q&A feature in Zoom to ask us questions. Um, please try to keep the questions out of the chat. I promise we'll see them. So we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. So again, today's webinar is titled Transcending Oppression, Uniting Against Anti-Trans Legislation and Inspiring Action. To give some context and background here, a few of my colleagues and I had been tossing around the idea for this webinar for a few months now, but it was the typical challenge of capacity, getting the timing right, and also quite frankly, the news cycle as it pertains to queer and trans health and trans rights have been absolutely relentless. So since this webinar's inception, a lot has occurred. Affirmative action has been scrapped. SCOTUS ruled that businesses can refuse services to LGBTQIA plus folks. Uganda passed the world's most horrific piece of anti-LGBTQIA plus legislation at the beginning of Pride Month, no less. Um, and we know that all these pieces are connected. They signal the height of Christo fascism, which is inherently anti-democratic, and it's nothing more than a campaign to dehumanize and demean our mere existence, the existence of trans, queer, gender non-conforming, and inter intersex folks. Um, and if you're anything like us, you're here because maybe you're concerned, you're fed up, you're looking for inspiration, action, hope, a way forward through the violence, the vitriol, the incessant anti-trans rhetoric that so prominently revealed itself in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and we wanted to share this space as a way to not only inform the public as to what's occurred so far, but to also call attention to the topic within the harm reduction movement. You know, it's so often I hear people discuss harm reduction devoid of any queer or trans or intersex identities, and that is truly problematic. Because we know at its core, harm reduction is bodily autonomy. Full stop. We advocate and fight for the rights and dignity of all individuals, people who use drugs, sex workers, trans and queer folks, intersex folks, black and brown folks, indigenous folks, disabled folks, immigrant folks, houseless folks, and so many more. In the days leading up to this webinar, you know, I've kept a steady eye on the number of registrants. Um, I think we have about 230 registered, but previous office hour sessions have had nearly two or three times the amount. And I think that's a pretty good indication of why we're here today holding this session and speaks to holding one another accountable for the conversations we're having and quite frankly, not having. So with that being said, I'm gonna now introduce our stellar lined up because truly they're brilliant. Um, I'm gonna read the full bio so that those listening audio, audio only or if you're in the car, um, you're gonna be able to get the full effect. So um, Harmony, if you could just advance us to the next slide and I'm gonna introduce Jordan Blisk. So Jordan Blisk is an associate director at the American Constitution Society and an LGBTQ plus activist, speaker, and educator. He received his undergraduate degree from Ball State University and became the first out trans student to earn a Juris Doctor degree from the University of Colorado Law School in 2018. Prior to joining ACS, Jordan was an associate attorney specializing in queer family law and estate planning. And before his legal career, he served in the United States Air Force as an aircraft fuel systems journeyman. Jordan was the first out transgender president to lead the Colorado LGBT Bar Association in 2022, and he currently remains on the board as the immediate past president. He also served for over three years as the executive director and board chairperson of the Colorado Name Change Project, working to provide direct legal and financial resources to transgender and non-binary Coloradans seeking to update their legal names and gender markers. In 2021, the National LGBT Bar Association named him as one of the 40 best LGBTQ plus lawyers under 40. 
and 2022, he received the Stonewall Award from the American Bar Association for his work advancing LGBTQ plus individuals and causes in the legal profession. Jordan is based in Denver, Colorado, where he enjoys fly fishing, off-roading, and spending time with his two dogs, Hamilton and Huxley. So glad you're here with us today, Jordan. All right, next slide, please. Awesome. So next up, we have Dr. A.J. Eckert, who is Connecticut's first out non-binary trans doctor and serves as the medical director of Anchor Health's Gender and Life-Affirming Medicine Program, otherwise known as GLAM. Dr. Eckert has provided 17 years or has 17 years of experience in LGBTQ healthcare with nine years as a provider of primary care and gender affirming services. After Dr. Eckert completed their education at Toro University College of Osteopathic Medicine and residency at NEOMEN Maine Dartmouth Family Medicine Program, they specialized in LGBTQ health. Dr. Eckert is board certified in family medicine. He's an assistant clinical professor of family medicine at Frank H. Netter MD School of Medicine at Quinnipiac University. Outside of their clinical work with patients, Dr. Ecker is active in education and advocacy. Since 2021, Science-Based Medicine has published 11 of Dr. Eckert's articles and the Journal of Medical Ethics asked him to be a reviewer. He was on the 2023 Abstract Review Committee for the United States Professional Association for Transgender Health, or US PATH. Additionally, Dr. Eckert piloted a fourth year medical student rotation at Anchor Health. Dr. Eckert has provided testimony for Bill SB1022 in favor of telehealth service access. In 2022, Dr. Eckert helped revise the Hartford Board of Education transgender and gender nonconforming youth policy and worked closely with the Connecticut Department of Social Services to change and update Husky Health policies on gender affirmation surgery. Most recently, Dr. Eckert provided testimony for an amicus brief regarding discriminatory insurance policies, which both restrict and deny gender affirming care. So glad to have you with us today, Dr. E. Next slide. Next up is Azzy May Niwalia. Azzy May is a 31 year old neurodivergent, trans feminine, non binary person living, working, and organizing in the greater Boston area. She identifies as a person who uses drugs and person who injects drugs, and she has been actively studying and consuming psychoactive substances for over 16 years. Additionally, prior to working in public health, Azzy May engaged in the illicit substance trade for over nine years, where she provided a great deal of ad hoc drug education, harm reduction education, and psychedelic first aid. Azzy May has been working in public health for nearly seven years. Having helped open the first syringe exchange in her hometown of Gloucester in 2016, she continued to work on the North Shore until 2019 when she shifted to doing outreach work in Boston. Currently, Azzy May manages a harm reduction program for trans GNC folks as well as cis women, most of whom are experiencing houselessness, engage in sex work, or consuming substances. And I agree, Alex, the best online social media presence ever. Azzy May sits on a statewide harm reduction advisory council and does independent training and consulting for organizations and the general public. Azzy May engages in a lot of off-hours public-facing, low-threshold education through various social media platforms, primarily LinkedIn and Instagram. Outside of work, Azzy May is engaged in political activism locally and nationally. Azzy May is a member of ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, the Boston branch, a member of the New England Users Union, and has been involved in or provided support for organizations involved in PWUD liberation, Black liberation, Indigenous sovereignty, anti-fascism, anti-imperialism, disability justice, immigrant justice, housing and houselessness, labor, and LGBTQ plus liberation struggles. So glad you're here, Azume. And last but certainly not least is Sasha Simon. After leading the development and evaluation of the US's first harm reduction-based drug edu education curriculum for high school students, safety first, some of you might know that, Sasha Simon MPH is the go-to source for school districts, organizations, and policymakers looking to adopt harm reduction-based approaches to drug education in their communities. As the founder and principal consultant at Sasha Simon Consulting, Sasha provides trainings and consulting services to youth serving professionals transitioning away from punitive, abstinence-based drug education and policies to inclusive, restorative, and health-based structures that support the whole child and their community. Sasha speaks and advocates extensively on topics related to teens and drug use, sexuality and health, adultism, and BIPOC mental health, building intergenerational coalitions and collaborative networks to empower youth as advocates to challenge political issues that directly impact them. 
She has dedicated her career to delivering innovative cross-sector approaches to public health and education and proudly served as the founding 10th grade health teacher at Health Education and Resource Occupations, or HERO, High School in the Bronx, a 9 to 14 Pathways in Technology Early College High School, otherwise known as PTEC. Sasha has also served as a health educator at GMHC, Columbia University, Hustos Community College, and York College. Sasha holds a master's degree in public health with a concentration in sexuality and health from Columbia University and received her BA from the University of Texas at Austin, majoring in psychology and African and African diaspora studies. After receiving her MPH in 2012, Sasha co-founded the Fierce Leadership for Youth Academy, a college prep nonprofit aiming to remove financial barriers to higher learning for first-generation college students of color. Under her leadership, the Academy has served over 400 students and raised six million in scholarships and sponsorships. So this is why I wanted to read all their bios because these folks are being humble and modest and this is only a snapshot of what they've all achieved. So I am so, yeah, Sasha's busy, Jose, indeed, they're all busy. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it off to Jordan and he's gonna launch into his presentation and we'll take it from there. So go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much, Taylor. And uh, uh, thank you so much for, for putting this panel together. This is, uh, I am truly honored uh, uh, to be in the company that I am. Uh, and hopefully uh, uh, we'll get to chat through uh, and give you, you all a better understanding of um, kind of where we are uh, on a national perspective when it comes to these attacks. I think we've, uh, I, th I think most folks who are here are probably aware that this has been a rough year, um, to say the least, and I'm hoping that um, we can flesh out your understanding of wh uh, what specific forms these sorts of attacks are taking and, and uh, where they're going next. Um, if we could get the first slide, please. Um, so the first thing that I want to uh, talk about is kind of the numbers here. Um, this is something that has been uh, an increasing problem, to say the least, uh, for the past few years, but it has really exploded um, this past year, which is why uh, you, you may not have heard of, about these uh, sorts of issues until now, but uh, now you're hearing about them all the time. Um, so uh, in 2020, there were only 66 uh, anti-trans bills introduced in state legislatures across the country. 2021, uh, that went up to 144 bills, um, crossing the, the majority of, of states uh, in the U.S. Uh, in 2022, it went up to 174. Uh, and then this year, it was 562 bills uh, in 49 states across the United States. Um, in total, 79 of those have passed, uh, and, and uh, 354 are still active, 129 failed uh, at, at some level of legislative process. Um, I, I, I want to be clear when we're talking about this, too, that if this feels like there's a coordinated attack, um, that's because there is. Uh, across the country right now, uh, there, we're going we're gonna to talk through what these specific types are uh, next, but across the country, they're, they're differing versions of these bills uh, that sound similar uh, in introduced across state legislatures uh, all across the country. Uh, and the reason they sound so similar is because they often are coming from literally the exact same playbook. And so I want to call out um, a couple of organizations that are really driving uh, a lot of this, specifically the Alliance Defending Freedom and the Family Research Council, which is uh, a kind of an advocacy arm of focus on the family. Um, and they're the ones that are, are, are really uh, drafting these anti-trans model statutes. And then uh, in some cases, the legislatures come to them for uh, a language that they can introduce without having to recreate the wheel themselves. Um, other times, they'll, they'll kind of seek out their legislature, uh, legislators uh, who are willing to peddle them across their, their state legislatures. And so um, for those who are unfamiliar with Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, to contextualize as well that this is not an isolated uh, issue that they target, uh, ADF is one of the major organizations that was responsible for uh, the Dobbs case last year uh, that severely restricted abortion rights in this country, as well as uh, the ones behind the 303 Creative case, which uh, very recently uh, 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 allowed, uh, opened, uh, uh, greatly opened the door for discrimination uh, against LGBTQ people. And so this is what they do. Um, this isn't uh, a hobby. These are very well-funded, very intentional organizations. Um, this is not a conspiracy theory or me reading tea leaves. These are uh, things that I would encourage you to, uh, to to educate yourself more on on what these organizations do and how they do it. Um, 
so I want to be be clear when we're saying this, that these efforts on their part are not being made in good faith, and so we shouldn't act like they are. Um, in fact, the ADF website explicitly states uh, one of their goals, uh, and this is a loose quote, as eradicating uh, what they call gender ideology. Um, so they're not being quiet. Uh, they're saying the quiet part pretty, pretty out loud. <laughs> um, so uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, we're going to talk about the main categories that anti-trans legislation has focused on recently. Um, the most common venue for attacking tr uh, trans rights has been uh, at the state legislature level, uh, which is what we're going to mainly focus on today. Uh, but there have been other forms coming uh, uh, from various government officials, namely governors and attorney attorneys general uh, in conservative states, as well as on the federal level. Um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about, talk about here um, are sports and bathroom bills. Uh, uh, up until, uh, I would say, maybe this the last couple of years, these were the two most common uh, uh, t uh, targets of anti-trans legislation. Um, the first one, anti-trans sports bills are, are known uh, otherwise as transgender athlete bans. Uh, are legislative for proposals that seek to limit the participation of transgender individuals in sport. Uh, and, and, and again, so that we're, we're all on the same page here, these, these, these bills are almost exclusively targeting transgender uh, girls and women. Uh, the primary purpose of these bills, as stated by their proponents, uh, is to ensure fair competition and to protect the integrity of women's sports. I can tell you, as a high school bas basketball player uh, on a women's varsity team in high school, they did not care about women's sports, and they do not care about women's sports. Um, the scientific evidence around uh, uh, the need for transgender athlete bans is highly contested, um, as I'm sure you are all uh, more aware than I. Um, and I also want to add here that I find these bills a bit funny because when I personally think of the trans community and, and those in my life who, who uh, make that community up for me, uh, I think of a lot of positive attributes, uh, kindness, authenticity, resourcefulness. Athletic is nowhere near the top of that list. That's, that's not to say that there are not transgender athletes, but I would not necessarily use the word athletic to describe um, us as a, a group of people. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Utah... Uh, the Utah uh, uh, legislature only identified four transgender children under their high school athletics association that the law uh, uh, banning them would even apply to. Um, so we're talking about four kids out of 10,000. And to also put that in perspective, they were told earlier in the year that the Great Salt Lake uh, is, is rapidly drying up, and this is what they chose to spend their uh, time on this year. Four kids. Uh, similarly, anti-trans bathroom bills seek to bar transgender people from using the bathroom, which aligns with their gender identity, rather requiring them to use the bathroom matching their sex assigned at birth. These types of bans have been popular um, since the, the, the first waves came about, and they're really based on an unfounded, uh, unscientifically established fear of transgender boogeymen preying on women in bathrooms. Um, I think there's kind of a common myth that people can identify a trans person just by looking at them, but that's just not the way the world works. And so whether you you know it or not, you have probably used a public restroom with a trans person, and I you, you didn't even know most of the time. Um, the, this is a non-issue. A lot of these issues that they're raising um, as, as though there's some sort of transgender attack um, are, are, are based in absolutely nothing, um, and, and I cannot uh, stress that enough. Um, I also want to note that when it comes to bathroom bills, it's it's not only trans people um, who are affected by this, but it's uh, it, it's also going to affect uh, cisgender uh, gender nonconforming people. Um, and so, with a lot of these things, uh, even though they are targeted at er er erasing trans people, um, there are often broader effects that implicate other members of our community as well who have uh, who, who, who are going to suffer uh, directly as a result of these, these sorts of things being pushed uh, on a national level. Um, so combined between sports and bathroom bills, uh, 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 those make up about 96 of the 560 plus anti-trans bills that were introduced this year. Uh, this map uh, here shows the 22 states where transgender athletes currently cannot participate on athletic teams corresponding to their gender identity. Uh, and according to uh, the Movement Advancement Project, uh, who aggregates this sort of data, uh, they, they estimate that about 31%, so almost a third uh, of transgender youth ages 13 to 17 currently live in states that have laws uh, preventing them uh, from participation in sports. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is 
the, the next one I'm going to talk about is gender affirming care. And this is probably one that, that you all have the most uh, investment in. Uh, this has been an early target of anti-trans activists for years, but we have seen an alarming explosion in uh, both the number and the severity of the uh, uh, language being passed across state legislatures this year. So uh, in 2018, two proposed bills dealt with gender affirming health care. Uh, by last year, that uh, number rose to 35, and then this year, it rose to 168. Uh, that's more than the number introduced in the last five years combined, uh, to put that into perspective. Um, so there's a spectrum of attacks on gender affirming care for minors uh, that ranges from limits on surgical care, but not medication access to state bans that make it a fel felony crime uh, for medical providers to provide best practice medical care for transgender youth. And I also want to pause here and, and, and uh, establish as a baseline fact that we are talking about uh, best best practice medical care that is a uh, 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 endorsed uh, by every major medical association uh, uh, that has an involvement in this. There's, this is not a debate uh, about what's best. We know what's best. Um, and despite that, um, these sorts of, of, of bills are uh, uh, continuing to uh, explode. Uh, and so uh, lawyers have been aggressively fighting back, uh, challenging constitutionality of, of, of these outrageous and harmful laws. Um, and often these attacks have been centered around gender affirming care for transgender youth specifically. Um, however, this year has brought some really alarming new attempts to limit gender affirming care for transgender adults as well, uh, with Missouri uh, becoming the first state in the country to actually restrict uh, gender affirming uh, care for people of all ages. Uh, additional attacks on adult gender affirming care access have come in the form of Medicaid restrictions by seven states, uh, which affect an estimated 38,000 beneficiaries, according to the Williams Institute at UCLA. Um, other attempts to restrict youth health care have attempted to broaden their reach by banning care for anyone under the age of 21 and in other states, uh, 26. Uh, still others are ripping pages out of the anti-abortion playbook uh, uh, and requiring uh, doing doing things to uh, uh, stop the flow of people being able to access gender affirming care by targeting all the ancillary parts of gender affirming care. So um, in terms of like informed consent uh, uh, procedures, some are now requiring those to be signed in person in front of a doctor, which really uh, eliminates access to gender affirming care for those who depend on telehealth. Um, so it's not just these aggressive overt, like we say the quiet part out loud uh, attacks, they're, they're, they're making sure uh, to be duplicative in all of these efforts. I think I want to say Tennessee has passed like three sports bans already. Like it's they're, they're making sure that this is uh, 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 airtight. And so uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, on this map here, you can see the breakdown of how states are approaching this topic. Uh, in some states, you have uh, folks actually going the opposite uh, of this and, and enshrining protections for people uh, providing health care uh, uh, into their state laws. Um, but unfortunately, as you can kind of see from the, the orange and, and red here, uh, many more states are uh, uh, going the opposite direction on this. And so uh, right now, 21 states have some form of ban on the books, and that uh, includes states that currently have uh, those laws uh, uh, held by injunction, uh, but right now that's uh, uh, all of the states that have them on the books. And MAP estimates that 29% uh, of transgender youth ages 13 to 17 live in one of these states that ban best practice medi medication and surgical care for, uh, for them. So um, I think you're all pretty generally aware of these purposes, uh, uh, the purpose of these bills, the medical baselessness that they're built upon, and I know Dr. E is going to get into this further after me. Um, so I'm just going to to touch on one kind of the positive part of this, um, and that's those 13 states plus D.C. that have gone the other way of the spectrum by, by passing shield laws to protect uh, transgender health care. Um, increasingly, those, the, these states, including mine, uh, Colorado, uh, are becoming havens for trans folks. I, I personally know people who have had to leave states where uh, they no longer feel safe. They can no longer access uh, medication they've been on for, for decades in some cases. Um, and so while there is a very alarming trend on the national level, it is, um, uh, I, I am trying to find a little bit of hope in the fact that some states are saying, yes, we, we, uh, we care about the trans people in our state and we are going to do right by them. Um, 
Uh, one last piece of this that I want to touch on is, is the impacts of bans on gender affirming care when it comes to intersex kids in particular, uh, because intersex uh, infants and, children's are often, uh, and children are often subjected to a range of normalizing surgeries uh, 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 that, that uh, are often not performed out of medical necessity, but rather to simply bring the child's physical sexual characteristics more in line with what we understand as typically male and female. Um, as most intersex surgeries are typically performed on infants and young children, uh, they are also typically performed without the consent of the patient. Uh, these surgery, surgeries can lead to things like scarring, permanent loss of sensation, lifelong sexual dysfunction, uh, urinary incontinence, and sterilization. Uh, these surgeries are uh, widely opposed by many intersex rights groups, and they have been deemed human rights violations by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and the World Health Organization. So to me, it's incredibly ironic that in the same laws, uh, that these states are passing to ban uh, best practice gender affirming care for trans minors, uh, uh, even criminalizing it in, in some cases. There are explicit exemptions for intersex children that protect the doctors who perform genital surgeries irreversibly without consent on intersex infants and young children. Uh, and, and it protects them from criminal, civil, and professional penalties. Um, in fact, the Human Rights Watch even stated that, quote, these clauses are in the same clause att that, that attempt to punish performing the exact same procedures on older transgender youth who are actively requesting such care. Okay, uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, we're going to run through kind of some other common forms of anti-trans legislation, uh, the first of which being uh, don't say gay or trans. Uh, Florida is probably the most uh, uh, popular <laughs> version of this, uh, infamous, I guess. Uh, it received a lot of attention last year, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of other states have followed suit. Uh, and so the goal of these sorts of laws is to broadly prohibit the mention or instruction of any topics related to sexual orientation or gender identity in schools. Uh, specifically, Florida statute states that, quote, classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through grade three or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. Uh, this year, Florida's Board of Education doubled down on this uh, this law and decided to expand this measure uh, to apply to all grade levels. Uh, these, this new rule prohibits classroom instruction on, on sexual orientation or gender identity through the 12th grade unless, quote, such instruction is either expressly required by state academic standards or part of a course that, the pa uh, that a parent can exempt their child from attending. Educators who are found to violate these sorts of laws uh, uh, risk losing uh, their teach teacher's licenses. Um, but, you know, the, the, a lot of times these these are very imprecise, and that's why I can't even read the definition of these laws without kind of rolling my eyes a little bit, because it, I feel like these statutes begs, beg the question on, on nearly every turn. Um, what does any of this mean? Does, does having a pride flag in a classroom violate, uh, does that count as instruction? What about mentioning uh, a same-sex partner? Um, does that violate it? These, these laws are very poorly written. Um, they're very vague. And, and, and in my mind, they're very flat uh, violations of the First Amendment. Um, unsurprisingly, literal book bans have also been wrapped up in this package of censorship. Uh, the American Library Association releases an annual book censorship report. And in 2022, it documented uh, 1,269 challenges to more than 2,500 books, the highest number of attempted book bans since the association began tra tracking uh, those efforts in uh, 2001. Uh, it represented a 75% jump from 2021, the prior year, which had previously held the, the record. Um, according to NBC News, the ALA reported that, quote, prior to 2020, the vast majority of challenges against such books were made by individuals who sought to restrict access to a single book that their child was reading. But the group found that 90% of last year's challenges were directed at multiple books, and nearly a fifth of them were made by political or religious groups. So I think that speaks to a lot of this this manufactured outrage uh, 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 and this 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 outrage machine for something that that kind of doesn't again exist. Um, uh, the next type uh, I'm going to touch on is is forced outing of trans youth. So uh, in four states right now, North Dakota, Iowa, Indiana, and Alabama, uh, there are explicit requirements that require school staff and in some some cases uh, any government officials or employees to out transgender youth uh, to their parents and or guardians, regardless of whether doing so would endanger the child's safety. Um, and I can tell from a personal uh, point of view as somebody who grew up in Indiana and, and uh, uh, was outed as a child against my will, like it's it, it's something that 
I cannot overstate when I say this is going to kill kids. All of these things are going to kill kids. Um, we, I, I, I wish that there was more of a silver lining to this, and and we'll get into that a bit at the end. But but I, I really want to impress that these things, all of these things, have a very 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 clear and stated goal of eradicating trans people in in every possible way. Um, and and we need to meet that threat uh, with the, the the level of aggression that it deserves. Um, parental rights. Um, so uh, a lot of the restrictions that we discussed, like curriculum and book bans, required outing, are often implemented under the banner of the parental rights movement. But really, uh, it seems like these sorts of groups are only interested in parental rights for people who do not support their trans kids. Uh, because when parents of, tra of trans kids say, yes, uh, we are going to uh, listen to the scientific consensus around this. We are going to support you because we know that this massively uh, reduces your chance of having, uh, you know, negative mental health effects uh, for the rest of your childhood. They want to call it child abuse. And so last year, uh, in breaking with the recommendations of every major medical organization and widely accepted research on the relationship between affirming parents and transgender children, Texas Attorney General Ken, Ken Paxson issued a non-binding opinion declaring gender-affirming health care to be child abuse. And Governor Ad Abbott uh, instructed the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services to enforce the opinion, uh, which they went on to do and opened investigations days later. In the years since, litigation has been initiated, and the Texas courts have temporarily blocked investigations against the specific plaintiffs who sued the state over the rule uh, until the matter is, is, is fully resolved in, in trial this fall. However, the ruling has allowed the state to investigate parents of transgender youth uh, for child abuse in the meantime, uh, who are not named plaintiffs in, in, in the suit. So uh, it, it, it's not really the, the win necessarily that we would hope for. Um, Another form uh, 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 of anti-trans legislation that they're, they're targeting is uh, ID access. So right now, Tennessee, Kansas, Ohio, and Oklahoma have all passed bills, making it more difficult or impossible for people to change uh, their gender marker on state IDs, driver's licenses, and birth certificates. Uh, ID access is critical to equal participation in society, and denying uh, one's ability to update their name and, and, and pronouns can place transgender people in uh, the square path of harm. Um, you know, if, if this one doesn't necessarily hit home as immediately, I, I would encourage you to think about the last time you used your ID. Um, you know, would you be as quick to accept invitation to drinks uh, with, with a coworker if you knew that you were going to be outed by a mismatching ID? How would you feel if a, a police officer pulled you over and you had an ID that doesn't look like you, doesn't match your, your name, doesn't match who you are? Um, uh, the next one we're gonna talk about is drag bans. Um, so these, this is this is another one that's received a lot of media attention. Uh, at least 14 states uh, via uh, 32 proposed bills have attempted to implement some form of ban on drag this year. Uh, like all types of anti-trans legislation, anti-drag measures vary widely, uh, but generally these bills define a drag performer as someone who uses, uh, someone using dress, makeup, and mannerisms associated with a gender, uh, uh, not associated with a gender assigned to them at birth in performance for an audience. That's a lot. Uh, some bills would go so far as to designate any establishment hosting drag performance as an adult business, which uh, uh, has zoning implications, making it illegal for them to be uh, located within certain distances of, of schools or residences. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and finally, uh, we have uh, religious freedom bills, and you've probably heard <laughs> a lot about that conversation uh, with, with 303 Creative, uh, but that's another uh, uh, big type of, uh, uh, that's, that, that's another big, uh, a question mark in terms of how uh, the perceived conflict between religious conviction and, and uh, uh, LGBT equality uh, will, will, will continue to, to uh, resolve. Um, so summarizing plain and simple, these, these bills are an affront uh, to the free, to freedom of speech, freedom of expression guaranteed to us uh, under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Um, I also want to point out that while, again, uh, similarly to bathroom bills, that while these uh, drag bans do target trans people to some extent, they, again, open up uh, within our community uh, who is a target. Um, these lines between sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender identity are very blurry. We talk about them often in 101, like they're completely separate concepts, but uh, the lived experience of, of uh, sexual orientation uh, kind of 
to some degree necessitates an understanding of, of what your own gender is as a reference. And so these things aren't uh, as clear cut and dry and uh, the bleed over from who these folks, who, who's going to be impacted by all of these sorts of, of, of hateful and bigoted uh, legislative attacks, it, it, it expands dramatically. Um, let's see here. Okay, um, so as uh, if we go to the last, I think this is the last slide here. Um, so as you can imagine, there have been countless lawsuits brought against the states who have implemented these statutes or other forms of, of anti-trans policies. Uh, there are simply too many cases pending right now in too many states uh, that are updating literally on a daily basis uh, to chat about all of them. But I'm, I'm going to just touch on the status of a couple. Um, and, and while discussions about our nation's highest court and the judicial system in general um, don't paint the brightest future uh, uh, for trans rights, um, I do want to maybe temper with a bit of uh, of optimism and and also alternative and so um so the good news to some to some extent um is that when it comes to trans rights in, specifically uh the supreme court's latest dis uh, decision on bostock v clayton county uh was a landmark case that addressed whether uh, anti-lgbt discrimination in the workplace uh, was prohibited under title VII's prohibit prohibition on discrimination quote on the basis of sex um, and in that opinion, the Supreme Court laid out a framework that explicitly prohibited uh, discrimination against transgender people uh, as unlawful sex discrimination in no uncertain terms. Uh, in writing for the majority, uh, Trump appointee Neil Gorsuch uh, stated, quote, in Title VII, Congress outlawed discrimination in the workplace on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or, or national origin. Today, we must decide whether an employee, employer can fire someone simply for being homosexual or transgender. The answer is clear. An employer who fires an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of a different sex. Sex plays a necessary and undisguisable role in the decision exactly what Title VII forbids. Um, so now, kind of weaving in the religious rights piece, uh, the largest issue that we're we're, we're still parsing out, um, and and I, I feel less optimistic with the court's uh, 303 decision, um, is is how this uh, uh, these competing interests between employers discriminating on religious grounds and, and LGBT employees uh, rights to not be discriminated against, how how all of that will uh, kind of practically uh, shake out. But um, with regards to the trans specific issues we've discussed. Um, when it comes to medical care for trans youth, many of the states that successfully pass bans on medical care have already been blocked uh, to varying degrees by the court. Uh, in 2021, Arkansas became the first state to issue a ban on gender affirming care for minors. And last month, a federal judge permanently struck down that law as unconstitutional, uh, though the state is currently appealing that ruling. Similarly, in Alabama, Florida, Indiana, Kentucky, and Oklahoma, judges have also issued temporary injunctions blocking part or all of the laws from going into effect until the cases are resolved. Uh, in Tennessee, uh, Trump appointee Judge Thomas Parker struck down a Tennessee anti-drag law targeting uh, male or female impersonators. Two Republican governors, Utah Governor Spencer Cox and Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb, uh, vetoed their state's respective ban on transgender girls' participation uh, in athletics. So in summary, I don't want to paint a picture that the trans rights are going to prevail here simply because they should, even with the full weight of academic <laughs> uh, uh, and scientific consensus behind us. Um, but I also want to hopefully give a bit of nuance and optimism in sharing that um, how these in sharing how these issues, unlike how they've often been handled in the legislature, have not always been decided uh, along obvious party lines when it comes to uh, the judicial system. Um, that said, it's also really important for us not to get caught up in expecting courts to deliver uh, uh, queer liberation. Uh, while they do function as a very important check on bigotry uh, in this country, obtaining rights isn't always the end of the story. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's for a couple of reasons. First, the people who don't care about science do not care about the law. Um, it, making it illegal and saying you, you can't discriminate is, isn't going to necessarily stop them from discriminating. Um, and hopefully, you know, it gives consequences for that, but uh, we can't force people to accept us. We can't force people not to be bigots. Uh, and second, um, as we've seen with abortion rights in this country, having rights that are long established uh, and, and to me represent bedrocks of, of American freedom, uh, uh, like right to bodily autonomy, they can go away. 
um, unfortunately, just as quickly as we've we've made progress uh, with with the uh, thinking about the trans rights movement as in the context of the LGBT rights movement uh, as a whole, we've certainly made progress and very quickly uh, comparatively to to other um, oppressed minority groups within this country. But those rights, uh, uh, I, I think, we need to stop looking to the courts to give them uh, to us and and recognizing uh, uh, that we give those rights to us and that we take care. Um, of those in our country, because um, marriage equality didn't give us, uh, uh, you know, ways out of poverty, didn't give us uh, uh, employment uh, access to be who we are authentically and not fear consequence or or, or housing or, or access to medical care. Um, you know, they're, 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 the courts are a powerful tool, um, but they are not everything. And so um, I think I'm at time here. So uh, with all of that said, uh, in terms of takeaways, and I think we'll probably get into this more in, in the larger group discussion later, but um, get involved, uh, use your voice and be willing to have uncomfortable conversations. Um, right now, there is a lag uh, in terms of public opinion and, and support for uh, gender affirming care in particular uh, with, with minors because there's been so much disinformation. Um, and so all of you that are here, this is an awesome first step to know what is going on uh, and to be able to combat that sort of rhetoric. And, and um, you know, I, I really encourage you to use whatever voice and platform is accessible to you uh, to, to have these conversations uh, and, and to uh, start dismembering some of these, uh, you know, really uh, bad faith arguments. You know, I mean, the, the, the transing a seven-year-old arguments and things like that. Um, we need you to step up uh, again in whatever capacity you have. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's the biggest takeaway that I, I, I can give um, right now. Uh, Taylor, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to you. Perfect, thank you so much, Jordan. I'm gonna give Dr. E just a few moments to pull up his slides there. Um, so we've got a lot to get into, but Jordan, thank you so much for doing the impossible task of having to distill all of that complex legal information in less than half an hour. So I just really appreciate that, uh, working with the time constraints that we have. And again, thank you everybody so much for the lovely convo in the chat. So again, just a reminder to please use the Q&A function for questions, and then we have the last 15 minutes or so of the webinar today to get into it. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. E. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you, Jordan. Uh, hopefully, I won't be covering too much of the same stuff, but I do think it's important to just review some of it. And I know I have a lot of slides here. We probably won't get through a lot of them. I was explaining this earlier. I just always like to have more rather than less. Um, so... Um, I am going to talk to you a little bit about the state of trans health care at the moment here. Uh, everybody can see my screen okay? I was, I did okay with pulling it up, I think. All right. Um, let's see. So uh, we went over some of this, but uh, just again, to kind of look at the map here of uh, what legislation looks like. Uh, as of June, and this is the newest map I could find, uh, but the worst active anti-trans laws, those are all the red states, orange states are moving in that direction, are high risk within the next two years. Uh, there's some low risk states, uh, and the safest states are the ones in dark blue, and then Florida is a complete uh, no travel zone at this point. Uh, and here, and actually uh, on that slide too, I mentioned how many bills there were. I mean, again, just to kind of piggyback on what Jordan was saying, this is an extreme increase compared to the amount of bills, uh, anti-trans bills from last year. And so right now there are policies and bans in all of the states in red and more policies considered in the states in orange. About 30.9% of trans youth are living in states currently that have passed bans of gender on gender affirming care, and 13.2% uh, more of youth are at risk of losing access to gender affirming care. So that is a total of about 44.1%. So these are not negligible numbers by any means. Uh, and 
essentially there are also an, the, uh, the newest thing here is that uh, it, it, through the HHS, taxpayer funding of hormone therapies, Jennifer surgery would be barred under the House Republicans fiscal 2024 spending budget. So if that's enacted, Medicare and TRICARE, which is for military personnel and their families, would not be able to cover gender-affirming health care. Uh, and children's hospitals that offer gender-affirming health care would not be able to receive any federal funds to train pediatric residents and fellows. As we know, hospitals are predominantly money-making systems, so that means a lot of hospitals are going to be shutting down their gender affirming care services uh, if they haven't already done so. And just to put in perspective what the costs look like for gender affirming care, because that is something that people always mention, uh, it's a tiny portion of public spending. So for example, I have Mississippi on here as an example. Over five years, Mississippi spent about 59000 on claims associated with uh, gender dysphoria and, as the insurance still codes it, gender identity disorder. Their annual budget for Medicaid spending is $6 billion, so that's really a drop in the bucket, but this is what we're putting all our attention towards. I went through some of the state bans. And again, Jordan already went through a lot of this and did a, a great job reviewing. But something that is really interesting to me, and just to further uh, drill the point home that this is all a coordinated attack, uh, there are bans uh, in many states to those under 18. Many of the states have exceptions for people with quote unquote medically verifiable disorder of sex development, there are states where there are exceptions for people to be able to continue on care and then wean off. So they will have access to care until a uh, arbitrary point in time. Uh, there are exceptions in other states where they specifically say for DSD or intersex conditions. In Florida, even adults actually have to sign a consent form now in order to be able to access care. And care is only available to be provided by uh, medical doctors. 80% of gender affirming care in Florida is done by uh, APRNs and NPs. So that really limits who has been actually able to access care as well. In Oklahoma, physicians can be charged with a felony and lose their licenses. Uh, in Man Montana, there is specific language that about permanent life-altering medical procedures, and doctors can lose their license for up to a year. Uh, that's one of the less strict uh, repercussions. And uh, again, there are other exceptions, mostly related to people with any kind of uh, developmental and uh, uh, differences in sexual development. So let's see. So basically what that means is uh, families are uprooting their lives, moving to states with protections for trans people, the ones that can do that. A lot of these bills, and we see that even with the House Republicans, when they're targeting Medicaid resources, they're targeting the most marginalized of the marginalized populations. So there are so many people who do not have the resources in order to just get up and leave their states. Uh, it takes resources, just a lot of people don't have. Gender affirming clinics in the best states lack the staff and the resources to support all the people that are coming in and need care. Uh, Rodrigo uh, Hank Layton, who's the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, uh, was quoted saying, we're hearing from families all the time who are terrified, who are facing very concrete, practical issues of my kid is about to lose health care, or my doctor, our family physician, who we've been seeing for years now says they won't treat my child anymore. So even in states where there are no bans currently, doctors are becoming more afraid and reluctant to provide care. Uh, and by no means has this care ever been easy to access. I used to have an entire PowerPoint about just access to care and all the barriers that trans people experience when they're accessing care. And uh, that's all just compiled on top of all these new issues that we now have to face. So basically, 
they did a recent uh, survey showing that about more than 40% of trans adults have considered moving because of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation in their state. Uh, and a lot of this legislation, again, to go back to the point that this is all a coordinated attack by uh, several well-known groups, such as the ADF. So talking about things like permanent life-altering medical procedures, which a lot of medical procedures are permanent and life-altering attempting to alter the appearance or perception. So talking about trans people in a very uh, condescending and dismissive way where they're saying what we're doing is altering something. It also is language that belies a sense of uh, where we're now trying to be deceptive or deceiving people. Um, validating a minor's perception of the minor's sex. So not, hey, this is a trans kid who needs the support as a trans person, no. Uh, youth doesn't really know who they are, and so we're validating their perception of who they are, which the underlying point there is it's not correct, and we don't believe them. Uh, they talk about irreversible gender reassignment surgery. That was actually something that frustrated me with uh, Husky policies in Connecticut. Uh, they changed the policies without letting anybody know, uh, without consulting anybody, <laughs> and uh, they included language around irreversible surgery, which I pointed out to them, all surgery is irreversible. And what you're really doing is dog whistling. You're using language of Abigail Schreier, of people who have really created and just fueled the moral panics around trans people. Gender altering medication, I don't even know what that possibly means. Um, and so again, these are bills being churned out by organizations such as the ADF, they all contain virtually the same language. They're essentially copy paste. They even have a model on their website that other lawmakers can copy. And then there are anti-trans, anti-science organizations that work with the ADF, such as the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, or SEGM, and the American College of Pediatricians. Uh, both of these organizations, and actually many organizations that uh, try to present legitimacy to the public and present themselves as scientifically based and just uh, looking for the right science, they uh, they model their names after existing organizations. So there is, uh, you know, the science, the Society for Science-Based Medicine, and there is the American Academy of Pediatrics. Those are legitimate organizations that both very much support gender-affirming care and science in general. So, uh, there has been more information coming out recently just about how much money is going to some of these organizations to promote things like debunking standards of care that exist. People are uh, essentially being paid money in order to say, uh, no, well, we don't agree with these guidelines for these reasons. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's all based in uh, zero science and all uh, their right-wing ideology. Uh, with the intersex and DSD exclusion, and again, this is something that Jordan did mention uh, briefly as well. Uh, essentially, we hear the right wingers talk about how they care about youth, but I mean, we know they don't care about trans youth, but further, they don't care about intersex youth or any youth with any differences in sexual development. So that's why the same bills that actually ban gender affirming care expressly allow for non-consensual surgeries on intersex newborns. Uh, procedures that are commonly used to police the bodies of intersex youth, but are virtually never performed on trans minors. Uh, so those interventions reinform rather than undermine gender essentialism, which is the binary gender beliefs that bolster the existing hierarchy between gender conforming and gender nonconforming people. So all of that is why intersex exclusions exist in the bills. They're present in 33 bills in 17 states with language that's sneaky enough to pass unnoticed. So instead of saying, instead of necessarily saying like intersex or differences in sexual development, they'll use different language around it. But uh, coercive surgeries have been performed on intersex uh, people for decades without consent, leaving children with long lasting effects. The UN and other groups have condemned those surgeries on infants, and yet they remain legal in all 50 states in the United States. And I mentioned uh, a little bit how some of the policies uh, that are forbidding, that are, that are banning gender-affirming care, 
talk about, well, if someone is already on gender affirming medications, they are allowed to have a time period to, you know, quote unquote, wean off those medications, um, make absolutely no, no doubts about it. That's forced detransition. That is all that is. And forced detransition is absolutely devastating. It's terrifying and it's life-threatening where gender affirming care can be life-saving. Uh, detransitioning trans youth is not going to cure them of being trans. It's going to harm them, increasing depression, anxiety, PTSD, and causing distressing physical changes. So uh, just a tweet here from Ari Drennan, who talked about, you know, the new right wing angle of attack. Uh, basically, the new angle going beyond what we've seen in the past year, which was protect the children, which it was never about the children, but most of us already knew that. The new angle is no one should have access to uh, gender affirming uh, treatment because it's quote unquote experimental. However, as we know, trans people have literally taken hormones since uh, for over a century. So all of these moves all of this, this whole idea is just based on lies and spreading misinformation. Even the American Medical Association and most medical associations uh, have a incredibly conservative lean, uh, talks about the decisions about medical care belonging within the sanctity of the patient physician relationship. That certainly applies here. And that is what many of the states are, are breaking those rules. So these bills that, uh, that claim to protect kids are actually harming them because medical experts support gender affirming care. Polit politicians should not be interfering in those medical decisions. Um, and contrary to the rationale used to justify these bills that outlaw gender affirming care in adolescents and make such care more difficult for adults to access, even with the uncertainties in the evidence base, uh, gender affirming care is not experimental. They'll use phrases such as low quality without understanding what that actually means. If we applied the same standards that they're trying to apply to gender affirming care to other areas of medicine, we would not be able to prescribe at least 50% of uh, cardiovascular, like the cardiac medications that we use. So gender affirming care, again, it is the standard of care and laws that seek to ban it are no more science-based than the laws to make ivermectin over the counter for COVID-19 or to limit school vaccine mandates or to license things like naturopathy and other pseudomedicine. So gender affirming care at the core of it is nuanced, complex, comprehensive. In that approach, it is important uh, for youth who are accessing care to have both their uh, medical guardian and or parental support and uh, mental health is a crucial element to care. That doesn't mean it's a gatekeeping step to care. It just means that it is important for people who are accessing hormones to have good support systems. None of this care is without precedent. Our model of care is well established and the existing research base overwhelmingly supports an affirmative approach. In the affirmative approach, gender diversity is depathologized. Being trans is not considered a disorder that needs to be reversed, although that is really the underlying message in many of these bills. And uh, the model follows our current understanding of gender identity. It's derived from decades of research and experience. And therefore, it's also endorsed by every major medical association. And again, I think it it's, bears repeating that medical associations are notoriously conservative. And it takes them a while to get on board with any kind of new approach. So the fact that they endorse gender affirming care is huge and it's something that gets overlooked uh, quite a bit, especially in these quote unquote debates. I'll call them debates, but uh, when it comes to life and death situations and when it comes to trans people and us existing, there really shouldn't be any debate to begin with. So the gender affirming uh, approach, you know, places significance on people understanding who they are and supporting people where they are and reassuring that there is nothing wrong with gender identity or expression. It can alleviate mental health, and behavioral concerns. Uh, and I mean, we know all of this, but just to kind of reiterate why it's important and what losing that access can look like. So uh, by the time too, and, and a, lot of, a lot of the fear mongering uh, centers 
the idea that if we don't have restrictions on care, then people are just going to be coming in and getting hormones on demand and accessing hormones and it'll be a free for all. And really, I mean, I don't think they think that thought through or uh, have any idea what the trans agenda might actually be. I mean, for us, it's literally staying alive and having equal rights, but and so uh, according to a 2020 research study, most trans children um, who do experience gender dysphoria will experience it by age seven. I mean, if that is even remotely accurate, that means that most people are spending years and years before they take any steps towards medical transition. And I know just from uh, life experience and also having patients that a lot of us have thought about it and have been in our heads about it and have gone through the pros and cons and all of this for years before we ever access care. By the time we see someone in the clinic, uh, a lot of our youth have already started puberty. And uh, basically, you can't really even provide medical or surgical interventions to anyone who hasn't started puberty. Uh, again, with the caveat that uh, surgeons still perform coercive surgeries on, on intersex infants. In most states, no one under 18 can even start hormones or puberty blockers without parental or medical guardian consent. And so that means that trans youth depend on their families for medical decision making uh, and often need decisions, you know, need, need their, need their uh, parentals, per, parental permission uh, to make any medical or legal decisions. So that means uh, a gender affirming care framework involves everybody who is involved in that youth's life and who is supportive. Uh, it also means that we are missing a good portion of people uh, who are unable to access care because they do not have those supports. And I'm realizing that I am for sure running out of time here, which I knew was going to happen. But uh, let me just make sure I don't miss anything important. I think, I think really, I mean, what I want to... Um, drive home is that there are so many barriers. I mean, there's so many barriers to accessing gender affirming care to begin with, even in the best states, um, even in a place like where I work in Connecticut, where we are supposedly a good state for trans people. I encounter a lot of um, hesitancy to even prescribe gender affirming care. A lot of folks who want to make sure that people have extensive mental health treatment before they can access care, where again, I don't understand why that is something that would ever need to be a requirement. Uh, and that's really only the only people that we're uh, regularly seeing in clinics are the ones who have the resources to be able to access our services. So this is uh, making those services even more inaccessible for uh, people who are low income, uh, for communities of color. Um, Non-binary people have a harder time in general accessing care in even trans affirming spaces that are predominantly still using a binary model of care. And then there are states who uh, do not have any LGBTQ community health centers uh, and now are closing down their health centers. So we're seeing a movement towards less doctors being uh, to more doctors being reluctant to provide this care, less doctors doing it, and those of us who are providing it being overwhelmed with the number of patients coming through because, uh, believe me, I'd love to be able to just help everybody and provide the care that everybody deserves, but more of us need to be doing it. And especially for my cis colleagues, a lot of times what I end up hearing in uh in relation to what's happening now in our country and these laws is their concerns about staying safe and their concerns about what they can and can't do where really the focus needs to be on our patients and on, okay, so what are we going to do and how are we best going to help our communities? And I'll stop it there. Beautifully said, Dr. E, thank you so much. And I know again, like with Jordan's presentation, so much information to try to distill in a very short amount of time, but you did wonderful. I see we have some questions coming in too, which is excellent. We'll save those for the Q&A portion. Um, so yes, as you may and Sasha and Jordan and Dr. E, um, if you could all just come on camera, because now we're going to get into our discussion portion. Um, so that was a lot. 
I think Jordan and Dr. E did a wonderful job setting the landscape, if you will, to really talk about the convergence of these, these issues, right? So talking about gender affirming care, talking about the spate of anti-trans legislation and how that relates to the larger harm reduction movement. So this is more for Azime and Sasha, because I know you've probably been chomping at the bit to get in. I really want to hear what you have to say. Um, so how do you see what Jordan and, and Dr. E talked about in relation to the harm reduction movement? Um, can't hear him. So we're we're really talking about parallel movements that are organized similarly and intertwined by like shared adversary and shared community. Um, the harm reduction movement and trans liberation struggles are both seeking societal acceptance and embrace for individuals, and they're both seeking systemic support from a system that prefers weakness or absence from us. Um, they both aim to empower the most marginalized, restore agency, restore autonomy, and promote authenticity, health, wellness, and joy. Um, they're both up against longstanding and newly developing science denial, and both, by nature of their existence, challenge the dominant discourse. Um, they both face waves of backlash after any inch of progress, and any outlier is used to discredit the majority of success. Um, and they're both fighting to preserve life in the face of legacy harm and death. Thank you, Azime. Yeah, and Sasha, I'm interested going off of that, you know, talking about these systemic movements and talking about, you know, in Azime's words, like we kind of get an inch, they take a mile back. And so from your perspective, given, you know, you co-created Safety First, what does this look like or what does this mean to you? Well, it brings me back to something that you actually said at um, the start of the webinar, and it's that harm reduction is bodily autonomy. And, you know, one of the main focuses of my work is empowering and reminding um, adults that youth have bodily autonomy, that they know who they are and who they are becoming and what it is that they want to do with their body oftentimes much better than the adults in their lives, oftentimes much better than their parents and their teachers. And we need adults to be ready, to be receptive, to be able to handle and accept their child or the children in their lives to you know, make decisions that are safe and that are healthy for them. Um, I think it's really interesting that with the passage of um, all the anti-trans legislation, Referring to the 2022 survey that the Trevor Project did, um, let me bring up the exact stats real quick. 93%, 93% of transgender and non-binary youth said that they're worried um, about transgender people being denied access to gender affirming medical care. 91% um, are of gender and um, trans transgender and non-binary youth said that they're worried about transgender people being denied access to the bathroom. And 83% of transgender and non-binary youth um, said that they're worried about transgender people being denied the ability to play sports due to state and local law. So it's very interesting to hear those stats to me because one, they're incredibly high. It shows that there is a great level of worry and anxiety that exists in the bodies of transgender and non-binary um, non youth. Um, but it's also, they're having con some concerns around things that have been shown to be very healthy for youth. For example, inclusion in sports. Um, that has been shown to be a great deterrent to, um, from riskier forms of drug use, riskier forms of sexual activity. Um, and when you're playing through political discourse and even through the passage of leg legislation in terms of trans youth inclusivity, you are going against best practices of public health that say the more that youth are included in their local community, the better that they do, the better decisions that they make, specifically the better health decisions that they make, the better academic decisions that they make. So you can really see the systemic issues play out, um, particularly among youth, um, and particularly among trans youth, when we are stripping away so many of the things that would allow them to be full body, full fledged, shining individuals, um, when we take that away, you will see health, health outcomes be poorer and poorer um, the more and more you strip those things away. Um, so I have many other things that I can think of, 
but they're all coming together at once. But I would point that out in specific that we are worrying specifically trans youth about their ability to be included and inclusion in and of itself tends to reduce um, the negative health outcomes that it is that we're trying to prevent for youth in particular. Right, and that's beautifully put because we're literally doing the opposite of what kids are telling us they need. We are not listening to kids, yet we're doing all this, uh, you know, decrying that we are protecting our children, right? And we are doing completely opposite because it was never about the children, right? It was never about the families, it was never, never about all of that. So what I'm interested in talking about too, because I want to be very intentional and careful with this conversation is, I'd love if folks could talk about the impact on BIPOC youth um, you know, and their mental health, because we really need to be intersectional and tease out these things. You know, we talk a lot about disparate communities, but um, there are so many layers to this, right? So I want to be very intentional. And if folks could kind of add to the conversation, things that we're maybe missing, where, you know, those children get lost in the gaps. And um, yeah, what your thoughts are on that. So that's, that's for anybody. I would just jump in quickly and 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 note that with regards to uh, banning gender affirming care, and and I think Dr. E um, uh, did a very good job of making this point that they are coming. To be very clear, they are coming for adults next. Um, uh, I I think it, it's telling that one of the ways they're going after that is is by targeting Medicaid, um, which is going to target poor people, and trans people are uh, disproportionately poor. So I think. Uh, you know, they're, they're, it's uh, the level of cruelty of some of these things is really impossible to convey, I think. Um, and I absolutely think it's very intentional. Yeah, Jordan, following up on what you shared about Medicaid, um, so I was born and raised in Texas and then spent over a decade in New York um, and did health education in both states. And one of the biggest differences that I know is the access to health care in New York, specifically for young people, and especially through the Medicaid system. Um, because in case you you guys are probably familiar with this, but um, teens, I believe, I believe it's as young as 12, but it may be 13, are able to access private health insurance through Medicaid and can get the sexual health services that they need. Um, in the state that I was born and raised in, you have to be at least 18, you need parental consent if you're not, if you're still on your parents' um, insurance, it's a whole thing. So it's a huge deterrent to young people accessing the, the health services that they need. And that's also evident in the, um, the health data of each state. You see much lower rates of teenage abortion, um, transmission of STIs, unplanned pregnancies, in states that make it easy for young people to be able to access the healthcare that they need. In those states that they don't, you see much higher rates of all of that. So the Medicaid system is very helpful if you have a state that is willing to be pretty liberal in, in, the, um, in the, the number of resources that they're making available to people and especially to young people. And the great thing about making this type of resource accessible to young people is that they will use it. And so they get into the habit of um, respecting their own bodily autonomy and in respecting their own decisions and also as accessing met, you know, healthcare services. And that is what we want them to do. And that is a habit that we want them to be able to you know, develop at a young age. But when you live in states where there's all this mystique and, you know, um, controversy around young people doing what they know they need to do for their own bodies, it's it literally becomes a hot mess and it's evidence in the data. And I think specifically in states where, especially the more conservative states, let's say, um, I think it's a great example where there are less and less gender affirming healthcare services, but you also see this rewriting of, you know, specifically black history, but you also see this kind of like glorification of um, Asian and specific Islander history, it's exhausting. It's like, where do I start? Um, what matters more? Do I need to choose? Um, and what do I choose first, you know? And do I choose at all? So it, it becomes quite um, an exhausting exercise being a trans and specifically from, you know, my perspective, um, black youth 
where you're just kind of being hit by all sides and not just through legislation, but also through, you know, the media and you see all these census killings and you have to process that. And, you know, then your teachers or your employer might be like, do you want to process it with me? And it's like, no, I really don't. I already processed it, processed it with my friend and my family. And it just becomes this oversaturation of like pain, bigotry and state sanctioned violence that you have to wade through. So I think it's a very heavy weight that we put on young people and trans and non-gender conforming um, young people and especially those of color. Thank you for that, Sasha. And thank you for pointing that out, those intersections. That's really what I wanted us to hit on. And this hits on Chantel's comment in the chat too. And to read it uh, back, at, Chantel says, trans black women have been under fire and have been experiencing extreme violence before the recent pushback against the LGBTQI community, which there was some discussion and representation on these pressing issues. And Chantel, you're absolutely right. We could always be, you know, we need to be critical of ourselves, our movements and push for more inclusion and do better. And, you know, I want to be very clear with everybody. We're not pretending that this is all of sudden new. This is a long game that these evangelical Christians have been playing. When I mentioned the Uganda bill in the beginning, this has been going on for eons, for decades, right? And then now they're kind of seeing the fruits of their labor. So um, thank you so much for pointing that out. We're not pretending that any of this has just kind of reared its head. Um, and I think this is just one of the reasons why we wanted to have this conversation, because we're not seeing these kind of conversations enter into the harm reduction arena. Um, and going back to something that, as you may, you were saying earlier is, I really want to know when we're talking about these issues, how specifically, how does this relate to the rights of people who inject drugs, who use drugs, you know, from your expense, your experience, your lived experience and living experience, um, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's absolutely no doubt that the people's liberation struggle and the trans liberation struggles are interlinked. Um, they share great similarity, and they're currently both facing huge waves of repression. Um, and we're talking about two presently and historically criminalized groups. Um, we're talking about liberation struggles of two specifically oppressed groups that statistically speaking overlap significantly, um, and that find themselves at the intersections of other areas of oppression. Um, as in every marginalized community, you'll find trans-identified people and people who use drugs, and in many cases, trans people who use drugs. Um, and these subsets will be additionally oppressed on this basis. And it's imperative that they receive support from the broader community. Um, both groups face science denial to the utmost degree. Um, both are impacted by paternalism and pervasive ableism within our society that says we are implicitly mentally ill um, and have to be saved from ourselves. Uh, the youth amongst both groups are viewed as victims uh, of those groups and of liberatory ideology as a whole, um, that they've been failed and corrupted by their parents or their peers, um, when in reality, like the broader communities that they belong to, they are harmed and failed by a corrupt system and deserve resources and support and education. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, as you may. I just think it's so important for folks to really understand, and I thank you for hammering home these connections, because again, I, I just am not seeing these conversations, these pieces overlapping. Um, so to kind of push us into different territory a little bit, because um, we talk about a lot of heavy stuff, but I would want to know from you all, how can we mobilize organizations and agencies that don't traditionally or have not traditionally provided services to GGNC, NBI people? You know, what does successful programs look like in your opinion? Have you been part of one? Have you started one? Um, just for other folks to kind of glean that information in the audience. Sure, yeah. Uh, so specifically what we're doing, and again, I mean, we're one small clinic, so we're trying to do as much as we can, but uh, Anybody that is coming in, like any trans refugees coming in, basically, uh, into the state, we are giving priority to as far as uh, you know, office visits. We are currently overwhelmed with patients and not taking you know, new patients unless it's an emergency situation like that. So I, I very much um, have put my information out there with several organizations to make sure that they know that we are 
um, here to take on anybody that's uh, coming into the state. As far as what we're doing uh, to help more just nationally, um, I am part of several kind of groups and uh, coalitions to try to work on and stay on top of what we can legally do and where there are boundaries of what we can do and what the shield laws actually mean and how uh, people are protected and where we can kind of push those push those laws. Like it, for example, if someone's living in a state where the state, the next state over uh, does not have bans, can they go to that state and get provided care there? So a lot of this is new territory and we're still figuring out quite a bit of this, but uh, I mean, I'm, and and this is, I'm not say this is not uh, me speaking on behalf of Anchor Health. This is me speaking as a provider who does this work and is really invested in this work. Trans healthcare has been underground before. I am fully invested in if we need to bring that movement underground, where we're going to do that. I've taken steps, you know, just personally um, to make sure that my patients are as safe and protected as I can keep them, you know? <laughs> so uh, I think that a lot of that is still in early stages as we figure out what we can and can't do. Um, but there are plenty of us kind of on the line of civil disobedience, if it means providing uh, what is really the standard of healthcare, what is gender affirming care. And you mentioned, I think in the comments here, the AMA, and they did come out and make a statement fairly recently supporting gender affirming care and denouncing the bills. You know, is it at least some effort was made on their part to make that statement? And I'm very happy about that. And hopefully that does mean that any uh, doctors who are still providing care, even in the states where there are bans, are going to pre be protected in some way, but the AMA has not made any kind of indication of what they're going to do as far as legal protections. So I think those of us in positions who are very much invested in making this work and protecting our patients are trying to, on our own, kind of create these underground networks, which is why your previous question had a hard time figuring out how to answer because like, yes, there are groups. And uh, I also want to make sure that the people involved in them feel, you know, like that they are safe and supported because a lot of what's happened and I didn't get to those slides is, uh, you know, the, the providers have been doxxed. Uh, there have been threats on, on people's lives. Um, certainly I've experienced it myself and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's getting to uh, scary degrees for some people to the point where they don't, they're just not providing the care anymore, which is really, really upsetting and unfortunate, you know, so long winded answer. I think we're still figuring it out. Uh, there certainly are networks out there and, I think a lot of this is just new territory of figuring out how we are going to continue to be able to provide this care well. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Dr. E. And I think what I'm also getting at too is calling in these harm reduction organizations and saying, you are part of the pie. You're part of this. You're fully capable of providing comprehensive care and services. And if you don't know how to do it, ask somebody. I know a lot of stuff like harm reduction was pretty much underground. It was illegal for the longest time. And then you know, like you said, Dr. E, we've been there before. One thing I will say that the Lighthouse Learning Collective is doing the program that I manage here at NHRC for folks unfamiliar. Uh, it's a collective of LGBTQI plus harm reductionists, harm reduction providers in New York City, but really now we've incorporated more folks across the country. We work on a lot of different projects, uh, basically to fill in the gap, so to speak, pertaining to queer people use drugs and do sex work. One of the things we're currently working on um, with Trans Equity Consulting, which is Cecilia Gentili's consulting group, is a gender affirming care toolkit for all 14 syringe services programs in New York City. Now, this is not a guide to simply say, this is how you inject estrogen or testosterone. This is what you do. We're past that, right? This is an accountability check to call people in um, to really make sure that our priorities and our values and our mission is aligning. Because a lot of times in the collective, we'll talk about, you know, we'll discuss everything is, there's like the kitification of harm reduction. There's a boofing kit, there's this injecting kit, and it's great to have supplies, but trans people just want, you know, for Sasha's words before, inclusion. They want to know that they're going to be treated with respect, with dignity when they arrive at their place of choice. 
um, and we're not seeing queer people, trans people, gender nonconforming, intersex people utilize the services that are available to them. And then providers are just like, well, they're going elsewhere. Where are they going though? And that begs the question about underground. As you may, I don't know if you have something to say on that, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, really creating spaces that are specific to trans identified folks or to non men and gender in general. Um, is absolutely essential and we are seeing it done and seeing it work to create spaces um, that folks who haven't engaged in care before, um, especially like thinking of harm reduction programs, um, folks who haven't engaged in programs before because they existed under threat of being harassed, being harmed, um, having transphobic violence or otherwise patriarchal violence like pushed against them, um, accessing these programs, getting linked to care, being navigated to like further services that could look like primary health care, but also could look like uh, accessing gender affirming treatment or gender affirming therapies, rather. Um, so, really making sure that you have programming that is explicitly set out to support trans folks and to not just like, not just include them, to be about them. Uh, yeah. And then, I mean, beyond that, like thinking of SCP, or, yeah, SCPs across the country um, and thinking about the inability in some areas to access um, pharmaceutical, like, grade um, hormones and having to access illicitly, like, manufactured hormones, um, we can be having conversations with people on how to do this, even without it being medical advice. We can be talking about subcutaneous injection and talking about intramuscular injections through the same lens that we talk about doing the same for IV ketamine or for, you know, other substances. Like, harm reductionists are already doing similar work to get that information out there and to prevent that gatekeeping that occurs. Um, and yeah, I think that just really empowering harm reduction programs with that education um, is the step forward at the moment. Yeah, and I'm seeing that echoed in the chat quite a bit. There's a lot of activity, and I love that folks are talking about self-care and how to take care of one another. And maybe that's a question I should ask you all, too, because that's very important. And I feel like on the whole, I don't want to speak for you all, but I'm very bad at that personally. And I know, Dr. E, you and I have discussed that, never feeling like we're doing enough. Um, and that's a really slippery slope. So um, I'd love to hear from each of you. How are you coping, dealing, grieving, whatever you want to call it, moving through this work? Yeah, I'm happy to chime in. I think for me, I just have to look at the long game. Um, you know, when I shared earlier, you know, being, I can imagine what it's like being a trans young person in Florida, where it's just like, what battle do I choose? And how do I go about prioritizing what? And it's just about, you know, really realizing that this is a, a struggle that will go on and be pervasive for the rest of your life. So what is a legacy that you can leave behind? What is a long game? What is something that you can commit to for 10, 20, 30 years that'll really make a, you know, a change? Um, you know, I'm a first generation American and navigating the American education system was not easy for me. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I have you know, in the past dedicated a lot of my time to making sure that for other first generation Americans can navigate the system and get the money that they need. And so that was me thinking long term about how can I make sure that other people don't hit the same obstacles that I hit and face those same things. And I think when you look at it as a long game, which I think when I was younger, that felt more exhausting. But now that I'm older, and I can't move as fast and, you know, do things as quickly, um, you know, thinking about the long game gives me a lot of peace. Um, the other thing I would add to that, just because it was, Dr. E, I really just commend the work that you you do. And it was really hard to hear you say that, you know, and, and we know that harm reduction has been underground in many ways for decades, but to hear your readiness to do so if need be, um, and and that that may be something that you need to do. A lot of my work is not underground. I get to be in schools. I get to be in, you know, work with CBOs that it's not difficult for them to find funding and to maintain it. Um, and 
one of the things that I have found and anybody else who may work with young people or work in schools, I would leave you with this, is just reminding educators and um, people who work with young people in particular that let it be okay for everyone to be in the room. Meaning that you don't know if this kid does drugs or not. You don't know if they're having sex or not. You don't know what kind of sex they're having or not. And I've learned that that type of framing um, tends to open up the person who is responsible for being the educator and the caretaker or the adult in the room. Um, it allows them to think more broadly about how can I speak in ways that I'm not offending someone or I'm not, you know, poo-pooing on someone's life because I'm assuming, well, kids shouldn't be doing drugs. So I'm just going to shit on drug users. Like, don't speak like that. You know, don't do that. Or they might use drugs in the future. So um, for those of you who work with young people and work in, in whose work is not, you know, threatened, you know, to the underground, um, encourage people to let it be okay for everyone to be in the room. And you will tend to find a lot more peace as well when you allow other people to have peace. So I'll just end with that. Thank you, Sasha. I love that. Um, as you may, Dr. E, Jordan, do you have anything to add? How are you taking care of yourself right now? Yeah, um, I mean, one of the things that I've found over the years is working in like direct care um, and understanding that a lot of the services that I'm able to provide through that on a daily basis function as kind of like a band-aid to a, a really big systemic bleed. Um, organizing and agitating on the outside, uh, that is what keeps me going. Um, because you're faced with moral injury after moral injury after moral injury um, when you're engaging in direct care. And I know that has to be the same when you're engaging in gender affirming care for trans youth right now and watching just this onslaught against them. Um, but being involved in the, the broader struggle um, and looking at the bigger picture and like the long game, like Sasha said, um, that is like really what this is. is it, uh, you know, a fight and a struggle that's beyond us. Like harm reduction will be continuing long after I am no longer in the field uh, because substance consumption will. And trans care will continue long after any of us are engaging with trans clients, patients, and, you know, siblings because we will always exist. Uh, and even in spite of all this, like, knowing that if we do have to go underground, um, not just as service providers, but as, as trans people, uh, we'll do this and we'll continue. Uh, I take a lot of solace in that. But also, you know, just being in community cannot stress enough how important it is to being in community. I can't uh, even begin to like really describe how um, lovely it is to be on this panel with y'all and how lovely it is to, you know, hang out with other people who use substances and um, other trans folks who are especially like in this industry or in these like surrounding industries of, you know, human services. Um, there's a lot of solidarity there, a lot of camaraderie and a lot of love. And I mean, that's what this is, you know, that's what we have to have in order to continue to do this is just a curious love for the people. Beautifully put, and thank you for that. No one can understate the power, you know, can't overstate the power of community, honestly. Um, Jordan, Dr. E, did you have anything to add to that? If not, we can move on to the final queue and then it's already time for our Q and A. So I just wanna give you space to add in. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would echo that as, uh, you know, keeping a focus on hoping that things are, that the tide is going to change, you know, that things are going to move in the right direction and continuing to do the work. I mean, just quite frankly, for me, um, doing this work is, was life-saving. Uh, I was not able to sustain a career as a doctor doing anything else. So I am consider myself very lucky to be able to provide this care, but also I consider it very much my duty to provide it correctly and to be able to help my community and to be able to do what I can for my community. Um, you know, 
regardless of what that means in the future, regardless of what that looks like. You know, I, I for lack of a better word, I guess I'm, I'm here to fuck shit up as much as I can using my degree. Um, and I, I mean, I, I just, I driven by that mostly. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it's really, uh, nice to be able to write for science-based medicine where I get to put some of these horrible bigots on blast too. That gives me great joy to be able to, uh, you know, take down SEGM and the ADF and all of this, uh, a little bit, at least. I mean, it's not a giant platform, but it, um, it's, 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 I just think that uh, the information does need to get out there. And if I reach at least, you know, one person, I'm, I'm, and especially if I reach like trans people in an area where they don't have access to care, you know, and they can read something and feel less alone. Like to me, that is worth all the work. I mean, and then the really cheesy part of the work I do in my clinic, where really it's a rewarding experience to see my patients, on uh, you know, on a daily basis to see the youth that I see thriving. Um, and as much as there are times where it's very upsetting and it's hard to have to be strong for everybody else because I can't have my patients thinking I'm as worried as they are. You know, I want to make sure that they understand I'm doing whatever I can in order to keep them, you know, with their with the medications they need and keep them safe and keep all of this and constantly trying to brainstorm strategies on how we do that best, including harm reduction, reduction techniques, including, uh, you know, phone calls with people out of state where they're potentially not being able to access care now and figuring out ways that we can get them their meds cheaper or figuring out ways we can you know avoid doing certain labs and do so it, it's it's all uh part of the work and i mean that's kind of just what drives me and keeping keeping an eye on hoping that things are that the tide is going to shift i i think i'm struggling with this question um because i i, I think Speaking for myself, it, it, it's it's been exhausting <laughs> um, this last decade um, of of anti trans backlash. I mean, I think it's I think this last year for me has been a real lesson in sustainability um, because I'm young and I want to be a part of this fight for a long time, um, and I I think. Uh, I pushed the gas at full throttle and thought that that was the best way to serve the movement. Um, and I didn't know how to look for signs of burnout in myself. And I think to some degree, I think we need to be honest, uh, especially for, for those of us who are in the queer community, like this is awful. Um, I am tired of begging people to stop trying to kill us. I am tired of begging people, other letters of the community to like, defend us at all like do anything show up for us give us you continue giving us your money like money dried up after marriage equality was won in in terms of national funding i, I don't know the exact statistics off the top of my head but we kind of got left uh in, in a way uh by others in, in our own community it, it, it has been exhausting um especially as a, as a trans man of color i for a long time at least to my knowledge was the only out trans man, of, trans attorney of color in the entire state of Colorado. Um, in, see, almost a decade now of, of being in the legal profession, I know one other Asian trans masculine attorney in the entire country. Um, it's lonely. It's really lonely. And I think, um, I love Dr. E's passion and fire. And I think that that's one side of the coin. And I think for, for others of us, I think, building relationships that are healthy um, and, and, and being able to have time to um, separate yourself from, from this work. I think when identity and, and work become so interrelated, um, I think that's where it's, it's easy to fall into that, that feeling of I'm not doing enough, even when there is nowhere else to squeeze time from. Um, and for better or worse, both, I think in this case, um, you know, for other people that are maybe feeling that way right now, like I, I, I felt like, I mean, for, for the last four years, every year has been worse objectively for trans people. Um, this year really takes the cake. And, um, for a long time, I think I struggled to 
take the time and the, the space and set boundaries that I needed to do because it felt like everything was on fire. And what I've realized over a decade now is that everything's going to be on fire for a very long time, like literally and figure, figuratively. Um, and we need to learn how to exist in something that our bodies didn't evolve to exist in. And it's awful. And um, you're not gonna be able to do everything. <laughs> and for me, uh, you know, last year, I I think I was on the edge of, of being at the, a very burned out place and I got hit by a semi and I had to take time off of work. And I, in the peak of my year of commitments to the LGBT bar, to running the Colorado Name Change Project, the things that, that you know, matter, the things that I, I felt like at this point make up my personal and professional identity, um, realizing that things continued to go on, that the world continued spinning, um, and that, yes, some things didn't get done, but that in the longer term, investing into myself and my recovery and uh, setting boundaries and, and creating just healthier relationships in general with the way that I engage with this work is uh, the best thing that I can do. Um, and that's hard to feel a lot of times. Um, lawyers are not uh, particularly known for being the most uh, optimistic bunch, uh, and neither are trans people. And so being a trans lawyer is... Um, it is waking up to the world on fire every single day and and uh, trying to find a way to get out of bed. And sometimes that's the win for the day. And that's okay because, um, you know, more than necessarily like the big splashy role models, what trans youth need out of people like me right now are to see us get old. Um, they need to see us be around. Uh, they need to see us model what it's like to have this this passion, this fire, this fight sustained over decades. Um, I think that's the most valuable thing that we can do and give to them is our passion, but in a way where um, our personhood uh, uh, doesn't fall into question. Because I think hearing all of this this dehumanizing rhetoric, I mean, it's 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 awful. Um, it, it really, really, truly is. I mean, I think of, and and, and I also think of you know like the larger implications of 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 this for folks who aren't trans or even LGBT in general um, who are on this call, like these are these these issues are raising very scary um, questions about our our democracy. Um, so, like an example of this, uh, uh, Representative uh, Zoe Zephyr in Montana was expelled from the Montana State Legislature this year for saying uh, that that the Republicans who uh, banned gender affirming care were, had blood on their hands. Um, and she cited as a, a call that she had personally received from a family of a trans kid who tried to kill themselves while watching testimony of the legislature by this. Like it is, it is, it is heartbreaking, heart wrenching, um, and, and like there's just there's no end to the well of suffering, and there's no end to the needs um, that our community have. And, and and again, speaking outside of the legal system, the legal system can only fix so much. Um, it's a tool, but it's it's not uh, it's not where our dignity is going to be won. And so, I think having um, you know being able to be be honest in, in professional spaces, it's hard even for me right now to say this to to to, to get over the guilt of saying like I burned out, <laughs> I burned out hard, um, and it sucked. Um, but I think we need more people who are who are willing to be honest about that fact and and, and honest about what that journey looks like. And I, I don't have all the answers. I'm still figuring it out right now. Um, speaking for myself, I've backed away from a lot of things. I uh, uh, burned all of my vacation time and took a three week trip to California with my dog. And honestly, didn't listen to anything in the news. I think we need to give ourselves permission, especially speaking specifically to like other trans people, other LGBT people. You don't need to know everything. Like unless you're literally an LGBT litigator or something that where it's like your job to know this, you don't need to know, frankly, the blow by blow of every attempt by every awful legislator to dehumanize you. You don't. Um, there's a there's a healthy way to in, in, interact with that information. Well, there's not. There's no healthy way to interact with, that, with this information. There are healthier ways to interact with that information. And uh, I think information overloading, doom scrolling, those sorts of things um, we're very prone to. And, and I think... Um, that, that, that's, that's not to say that we need to have this like smiley face optimism or it's all going to be fine. Like what, 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 what was the, the um, uh, like 
the, the, the big, you'll, you'll get through it. It'll get better, whatever that's slogan. Like, I don't want to slap that sticker on this. This sucks. People are dying. Not everyone. When, when, when in 20 years, pe certain people, pre more privileged people have survived and they get to say, we made it through that. There's, there's going to be survivorship bias for so many people that didn't. Um, and that, that's hard. Um, that's, that's, that's hard to, to, to process that there are peers who I missing in, in my world as a, as a, a queer attorney, um, because they never got the chance, uh, uh, to make it out of teenagehood because being trans wasn't an option. They never got to uh, make it to college because they were too busy trying to, uh, pay medical, like necessary for necessary medical care and, and legal name changes. I mean, Oh, this is, it's an endless well, but I guess um, summarizing, I, I think we need to talk about this, especially in professional circles. I can, I can really only speak to the legal community, um, but I, I think this is something that, that's shared amongst friends of other, of other uh, uh, fields is uh, just this ability to be honest um, about what the tools of advocacy over a long period of time do, does to somebody. Um, and I think we need to allow ourselves to say no. And I think we need to allow ourselves to the, the permission to not know certain things. Um, I think those are all things that maybe feel counterintuitive, uh, but I think the, the more that we can give ourselves grace and permission to recognize the crushing weight um, of what it takes to get up in the morning, uh, the more I think we're able to get up out of bed and and go forward and 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 hopefully advance things a little bit further with that day. So. Thank you so much, Jordan. I love how you're like, I have no, it's hard for me to find the words. And then there's a lot, right? Because I think speaking to what you were just talking about, we bottle a lot of this up. And then once we feel comfortable, we can really talk about that. And I hope this is a somewhat comfortable space for you all. Um, we have a lot of feelings, a lot of thoughts, but what all of you picked, what I picked up on with all of you and each of you is this theme of resilience, right? Like we might not have used all the, the verbiage and the words to express that, but there's this just resilience, right? And this willingness to provide for future communities. You know, as you may saying like, look, harm reduction is gonna be here long after I'm gone. Dr. E is like ready to throw down, go underground, all that, like Sasha's gonna do it. Jordan's here talking about it, breaking down a lot of the stigma and a lot of the barriers with this. Um, so we're gonna go right into Q and A um, cause I see we have a few questions there and I wanna make sure to get us out on time. Um, so this first question, says, what studies would you like to see funded to address challenges, stigma, and barriers to gender-affirming care? So, Dr. E, I don't know if you have anything in the realm. I see you over there. Sure. Uh, I would like to see less studies on trying to figure out why we exist and trying to find uh, biological underpinnings as much as I think some of that can be helpful. I also don't think that that is the priority right now. I'd like to see uh, more studies on why we're not teaching medical students about trans people. Why, since I was in med school, which is longer ago than I care to admit, like nothing's changed since then as far as just education. Um, and that's that's part of uh, what's really important to me. Like, I would love to have more competition in the field. I'd like to have people who are primary care doctors, family doctors, pediatricians, internal medicine, be able to actually see trans people and treat them as humans, treat them like everybody else. But inevitably, I have the experience of, I don't think I've had a single patient who has told me they've had good past healthcare experiences. And even on a personal level, that's very true. So what I think needs to happen is uh, not the one hour lecture that uh, medical students get uh, that covers all LGBTQ identities in just kind of one kind of fell swoop. Um, I think that it needs to be something where we really integrate, uh, you know, all of that into the curriculum throughout, you know, medical schools. And I, I'm speaking to medical schools because that's what I know of, but I think that needs to be true for the entire education system, because otherwise, how are we, how are we building empathy? How are we uh, teaching people how they can interact uh, with us when we're still do using this othering experience and still relegating us to like an afterthought? Um, you know, I recently had to argue for my two hour lecture on trans healthcare to medical students 
to not be shortened down to an hour because two hours is barely enough time. I mean, really what they need is an integrated curriculum and not just true for medical school, true for like everybody so that we can all kind of understand that we are all human, we all have common ground and that uh, part of it is that people need to have the experience of uh, being able to yeah, talk to talk to trans people and try to kind of empathize and understand some of our experiences because you know some of these bills that I see, so these doctors that I see speaking out against gender affirming care, they've never, and I, I you can just tell by the language, they they have never even talked to a trans person in their life, nor are they interested in doing that. And that's the attitude I see with a lot of healthcare professionals. It's not even uh, that they're willing to learn. They just don't even care. They'll just, they'll, they'll go to the, go to the LGBT clinic. You know, they, they'll like the, the moment someone comes out, it's like, okay, I've been your doctor for years, but now I just don't know what to do with you anymore. You know, that just needs to change on a very systemic level. And I don't have faith it's going to be tomorrow. I just think that needs to be, you know, kind of like, we really need to work on, um, and not us. I don't think that's our responsibility here. I think that we need our allies and we need the rest of the LGBTQ community in support to help us um, actually get the recognition, you know, and get the education out there. So. Thank you for that, Dr. E. And one thing you said, you know, talking about certain providers, you can tell by the language, they don't really know what they're doing. They're not too keen on what's going on. I will never forget being in a lecture given by a medical provider saying that, you know, he does gender affirming care. And the first picture he shows is Jared Leto in Dallas Buyers Club. And I would just walked out and had it and I was over it. And so that's all I'll say about that. Um, we do have other questions. I'm hoping to get to all of them, but this next one I think is, is really interesting. So Max says, how do you see this rise in anti-trans legislation, et cetera, impacting intra-community conflict? I find this being one of the most disheartening things recently. Yeah, that's a big one. I'll post that in the chat as well. So speaking as a cisgender Black woman, and I'll try to be quick, um, just recently I was on Instagram scrolling through and there was... Um, there's a popular comedian who was mistaken, a uh, cis woman, mistaken as being transgender. It was this whole thing. She made an announcement on the internet and I haven't been keeping up with it. But the point is that there were many cis black women who were like, I will always support my trans, you know, black sisters, all of that. Just don't call me a cis woman. Like, I don't understand, you know, I don't get it. And it just like created this whole divide. And many people are just like, we're just trying to have clear communication by using cis. We're not trying to take anything away from you. That's not what's happening here. You know, you're not some specialized type of woman just because we put cis in it. We're just trying to communicate clearly. And, um, you know, it's it's been interesting to see other cis Black women affirm their support of trans Black women. However, it's very disheartening to see that. And I mean, they need space to express and figure it out as well, right? But it is disheartening to see that like, you know, that kind of, I'm a woman through and through, you can't tell me nothing, kind of like all that bravado, you know, um, has been difficult to, to watch that happen. But it was also good to see that kind of like, I'm, I'm still here for you, but just, I want to be called this. So it's like, it's interesting to see the conversation starting and happening. And ideally people stay in dialogue to, you know, get at a more shared space that's more liberatory for everyone. But, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable right now. I'll say that. Do others have thoughts on that? So it's a big one. It's a big one. Now we'll move on to the next one. Dr. E, did you want to say something? Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, uh, with Elon Musk banning cis, you know, banning cis, saying that it's a slur on Twitter, I, it's just, I know the sentiment was there before, but where cis literally is just a descriptor, and it's all about inclusivity, and I see so many people, I mean, it's so hard not to read comments on posts, and if you go into the comment section, so many people get angry about things like, oh, don't call me cis, as if it is part of some kind of ideology. And it's just the uh, like 
really rampant misinformation out there that's uh, making people think without even critically thinking about it, like, oh, this is a slur. If I'm being called this, I'm being called something and I'm not this thing. It's like, no, like literally you are though. Like literally, like if you're, you know, so I, I, I don't know. I just, I just find it um, really upsetting the amount of like misinformation that's out there, but also within the community, how much uh, I see respectability politics uh, playing a bigger and bigger role with uh, people just distancing themselves from the T as much as possible. I mean, I see this even locally and uh, yeah, I mean, there are times where I'm really tired of getting painted in the corner of being an angry trans person and having that just put on me as if I complain about anything or if I'm upset about my queer space for not doing a good enough job to actually support me, then I'm just being angry because uh, that's just who they expect me to be. So yeah, I going off on a complete rant there. I think that I really, what I'm seeing is a lot of division there and a lot, a lot of people distancing themselves and being like, well, that's not me. So I, it's, not, it's not my struggle and moving even further away from uh, supporting us. I'll jump in quickly on this here too. I, I think, I, I find it very uh, disheartening as well. And I think it speaks to our, our inability to have nuanced conversations and, and have simultaneous things be true at once. Um, you know, I, I think it's hard because there is scarcity, right? And and yet at the same time, like liberation isn't something that we're going to get peace. Like it's not like a pie. Um, it's not like a consumable item where where you got to fight and scrap to get your 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 slices. And so it shouldn't be at least. Um, and so it is it is disheartening. And I and I think I spoke to this a little earlier, um, specifically as as a trans person feeling left behind um, in a lot of spaces. I was in the military when. Uh, right after Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, I enlisted, uh, I swore in while it was, uh, it had been repealed, but it hadn't gone into effect yet. And by the time I started, it had gone into effect by a couple months. Um, and then there was the trans ban. <laughs> um, and a lot of those allies dried up. And so I think um, it does give me a lot of concern because right now we're targeting um, by numbers, at least, uh, trans people are probably the smallest minority to incur uh, this degree of legislative and political ire, um, just in, by by the statistics of, of, of how many um, folks belong to like a racial minority group, et cetera, how many people are gay versus trans. We're, we're tiny. We are a tiny, 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 tiny sliver of the population. Um, and I think for a long time, there was a, a knowledge of what being gay was, even when there was a lot of like stigma and revilement towards gay people. Um, there's still kind of an understanding of what it was. I feel like in trans spaces, we didn't necessarily really get the chance to explain even who we are, um, what being trans is before all of this just mis misinformation, disinformation machine kicked in. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I do worry um, about, uh, um, <laughs> I think uh, a lack of solidarity uh, between the the letters of the community, um, particularly uh, in light of the severity of the threats and the fact that they're targeting kids. Um, they're targeting arguably some of the most vulnerable people in our entire community. Um, I wish that there was more, um, more, more, more cis queers uh, rallying in support and throwing uh, their weight behind because I think you know, even in not, even, even if we take out the altruistic element of, of empathy and caring about trans people, they're coming for you next. Like, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think that's um, really reading the tea leaves, so to speak. That's pretty obvious. Um, and so uh, we're all in this fight together. These, and I, I think uh, as you may comment just uh, about these uh, common goals and themes within these communities and bodily autonomy, like, that's that's why I think in part it's been so exhausting to scream about all of this for years and then only have mainstream America care about bodily autonomy when it came to abortion rights. Meanwhile, trans people's bodily autonomy, <laughs> does it exist? Arguably not. Um, so, you know, it, it is it is um, it is concerning. And, and I think that's that's where, again, like my call to action, so to speak, and I know everyone's going to be sick of hearing this, but one vote. Um, it, it takes no time out of your day to do, do well, unless you're in the state that makes it take time out of your day, but, but it, it's a low, low effort thing to do, um, do it. <laughs> but also again, recognizing that like, 
there are limitations to how our system of government is going to achieve uh, steps towards liberation for, for queer people. And so we need you to go beyond that. We need you to start correcting other cis people. We need you to start like getting in faces, making, being Karens, being mad, get angry. I'm tired of being angry. I need other people to be angry. Um, and so, yeah, with that, I, 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 I hope for, for non-trans folks in the audience that this has helped give you some, some better clarity, understanding around these issues. And I, and I hope that going forward, you'll be willing, uh, to stand up for us in the ways that you can, because yeah, trans people don't read the comments. Cis people, if you want to go argue with them, knock yourselves out. <laughs> Thank you for those parting words, Jordan, because you're so good at flowing. So I'd like to ask the same since we are a little bit over time, but this is just too juicy, too good. I'm not going to cut you off. So Sasha, Dr. E, and Azime, if you could just leave us with like one thought kind of to sum up everything and wrap it up. What's the lasting impression that you want people to take away or come away with after today? I think the biggest thing in general and this conversation is highlighting that is that people know themselves better than anybody else outside of them knows themselves or knows them. They know what they need. They know what they're striving for. And I think the better that we respect and protect people's ability to live their lives the way that they know they're meant to live it, the better off everyone will be, period. So I'll just kind of leave it at that. Thank you, Sasha. Yeah, as you may, or Dr. E, what do you want to leave folks with? Uh, I guess there, there'll be no liberation for any of us without collective liberation for all of us. Like, all of these struggles are intrinsically linked, whether we're talking about the struggle for people who use drugs, um, whether we're talking about disability justice, whether we're talking about climate justice whether we're talking about Black liberation or Indigenous sovereignty or LGBTQ, IAP plus liberation, like all of these struggles are linked and we do all have a common adversary. Um, and that is an overarching system that aims to keep us divided because that will continuously keep us in check from interrogating why that system wants us divided um, and how much more capable we are than that system will ever allow us to be, you know? Um, so yeah, struggle alongside of each other and love each other. I think too that it's important to understand that our existence is, uh, it's not a debate and it's not up for debate and any efforts to restrict or remove or question or scrutinize uh, gender affirming evidence-based science-based care it, none of this is a culture war. None of this is a debate. These are all baseless attacks. Um, and this is about trans people in our private health care in a way that's been made very public. Uh, these are that this is the same kind of care that cis people access, uh, and it's never scrutinized like this. Uh, we have to understand that we are all we are all people. We're not we're not a side, right? We're not an ideology. Uh, if anything, I mean, it is the conservative right wing people who have been, again, like working on this ideology since at least 2015 and bring and putting all this into this concerted effort against us. Uh, and that we, at the end of the day, I mean, the only agenda I know that trans people have is to stay alive and stay safe. And uh, some of these, some people are making that much harder for us to be able to do. I mean, this is not about anybody wanting special rights. We want we want equity. We just want to be able to like leave us the hell alone and let us live. Beautifully said, and thank you all. I know none of us are succinct people, so this is so difficult, myself included, but I cannot thank you enough. Uh, thank you, Harmony. So the feedback form, the QR code is on there. Um, this was amazing. I had somebody chat in and ask if there were going to be more. If there's a part two, we don't have anything scheduled, but obviously this is a starting point. Um, and I apologize, we didn't get to everybody's questions. But what I'm going to do is forward those on to our panelists if they'd like to, you know, respond. Then we can provide that in the follow-up email that should be going out within the next week, along with the recording, the slides. Um, so again, thank you everybody so much for sticking with us. This was fantastic. Thank you so much to Azzy May, to Sasha, Dr. E, and Jordan for going over time with us. Um, 
And I'm just so appreciative that you took time out of your super busy schedules to hold space with us, to share all of your thoughts, talk about all of the things, because this is just, again, so much to talk about. So um, Harmony, if I could just ask you to post one more time the link in the chat for folks to, clink on, to click on it. You can also access the survey form via the QR link, but um, yeah, thank you so much. And please check out the resources as well that Harmony posted in there. Those will be provided in the email as well. So thank you. Thank you.